Hey, I'm Doug Ullman. I'm here for the American Battlefield Trust in Gettysburg 159, and I'm standing out in Rose Woods. And as you remember, we're trying to drill down from the big picture down to the little picture, the small individual actions of soldiers and regiments as we talk about the battle here on the 159th anniversary. So I'm standing in here in Rose Woods. About 500 yards in that direction is Devil's Den. Off to my left would be Little Round Top, and behind me is George Rose's Wheat Field. Uh, this is where on the afternoon of July 2nd, Hood's division is attacking more or less right to left to right across my front, across the camera's front, in the direction of Devil's Den and Little Round Top. And I'm standing in the area where George Tig Anderson's Georgia Brigade is going to fight through Rose Woods. While they are in these woods, they're going to be met by units of the, U uh, the U.S. 3rd Corps. This is the brigade of Régis de Trobillon of David Burney's division. Remember, when Sickles takes his advanced line, he has to spread his three brigades out. Ward's brigade is over in Devil's Den. Graham's brigade is up at the Peach Orchard. And so de Trobriand's mixed brigade of Michigan uh, and Maine uh, troops are in this area here with one regiment of Pennsylvania, uh, more or less guarding this massive gap in Sickles' line. As things start to start to develop, he's going to send one regiment down to a stone wall just on the other side of these woods, and that is the 17th Maine, commanded by Charles Merrill. In this direction, uh, the brigade of George Tyke Anderson's Georgia Brigade is going to be moving in this direction, and we're going to follow the 9th Georgia, which by the end of the day will be commanded by a man named Captain George Hillier. We're going to walk in those footsteps and then go out to the wheat field itself. So welcome to the infamous wheat field here at Gettysburg. This is the spot where some 20,000 Americans are going to fight for several hours on the afternoon of July the 2nd. We're standing along the line of the 17th Maine. Off to my right is their beautiful monument here at Gettysburg. Um, and we're going to talk first about uh, the experience of one man of the 17th Maine, that is uh, John W. Haley of Saco, Maine. Oh, he has wrote a, a very uh, detailed diary and letters of this, of this fight here. Uh, so we'll read just a little bit of his account. Uh, in describing the Confederate advance, he says, The Confederate advance was very impetuous, and our skirmish line, which would have been in the woods where we started, uh, our skirmish line were quite... Uh, although exceptionally heavy, was brushed away as chaff before the wind. This was due to no fault on the part of the skirmishers, but to the size and momentum of the attacking column. That's George, uh, George Tig Anderson's Georgia Brigade, including Captain Hillier. The, and again, he says here that the attacking column, which we know to be one brigade of Georgians, is, he, uh, Haley will call it, say that it is comprised nearly one half of Lee's army the flower of it at that time. By the time our line was formed, the rebel, rebel column had arrived at the opposite edge of the woods, and although we opened a brisk fire on them from behind the wall, it didn't seem to check them much. As they drew nearer, our fire began to tell on their ranks, which were more dense than usual. We peppered them well with musketry while Randolph's battery, that's the guns over there, commanded by George Winslow, while Randolph's battery, which was on a gentle rise in rear of us, delivered a dose of grape and canister every few seconds. George Hillier of the, of the Captain George Hillier of the 9th Georgia, he remembers that grape and canister. He says, I saw cannon belching forth volumes of smoke all along its summit, the summit of the rise of ground you see over behind me, but heard no report from them. The roar of musketry and the shouts of men, our men drowned every other sound. We did not pause or hesitate a moment, but advanced, emerging from the timber one or two hundred yards to the very foot of the hill and within a stone's throw of the cannon. During this charge, I saw our men falling in large numbers, and the enemy's infantry were retreating before us, suffered who were retreating before us suffered heavily, particularly as they went up the hill. I saw the ground plowed and torn by grape and shot and shell. Still, I heard no distinct sound, so great was the roar and din of the battle. 
This is more or less the opening shots, the opening phases of the fighting in the wheat field. The, uh, the main men of Detrobriand's brigade are going to be pushed back all the way to the guns. They're going to hang on just a little bit longer until Second Corps reinforcements come through here, and then the fighting is really taking off. But just imagine. Uh, Captain Hillier of Georgia is saying that the, the firing is so loud that it drowns out every other sound and the fighting in the wheat field has just begun. That's great stuff, Doug. And let me just say that uh, you, Doug, mentioned that this is the opening sort of phase of the wheat field. And from these videos, you're not going to come to understand the wheat field. Try reading a few articles and a few books and you still might not get it. But as far as that opening phase, it is the 17th Maine sort of alone in this general vicinity right here, supported by General uh, Ward's Brigade. This is John Henry Hobart Ward, who's over connecting the wheat field to Devil's Den, essentially. And the next regiment over is really some Indiana soldiers. They had to plug a gap where some Pennsylvanians had left. And what you have is a bunch of Confederates in the woods behind Chris White, behind the camera there, mainly Arkansans, and they're not, um, unable to move on, with Yankees on their front and flank confronting three or four different regiments. That is until uh, Anderson's brigade arrives, until George Hillier and others arrived. And one time I gave a tour of a guy who had five ancestors in the 59th Georgia. Now they're way on the right or the end of the line uh, in Anderson's brigade, and they were confronting the uh, soldiers of the 20th Indiana. And one thing that I really liked about this is that they talked about pushing the Andy Indianians back. This is when war brigade is actually ordered back when Cross's brigade is showing up as part of Caldwell's division, Cross, Kelly, Zook, and Brooke uh, showing up to clear the wheat field. As they were pushing the Indianians back, there was a discussion that, uh, or a remembrance in his family that these brothers and others in the 59th Georgia were laughing and slapping their knees in victory as the Union fell back. And that's not something you hear a lot, of, a lot about. And that story was passed down through generations until this gentleman wanted to go to the spot and we did. So I thought I'd relate the story for you, Doug. Well, it looks like Doug is done for the day. So we got Doug Ullman, who I want to thank right now. Thanks to the soldiers of the 17th Maine and to those in Anderson's Brigade and to those in Ward's Brigade. And I'll stop with that. So thank you all for watching, for supporting Battlefield Preservation and Education.